So uh, here is our agenda for the day. It looks pretty full, but we hope it'll be really fun and interesting. We have some really great uh, groups that will be meeting with us um, and just talking about you know, tobacco policy and how it really affects youth and, and what we can do um, through advocacy to really make a difference. So uh, today we'll be going from three to seven uh, with assorted breakouts um, and breaks throughout so we can make sure that you have um, a wide array of information coming to you and, and ways to think about the work that we're doing. So um, yeah, so that is where that is. Does anybody have any questions before we continue on? Excellent. Okay, um, technology Hello. overview. Can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Uh, I just wanna make sure everybody can hear me. My name is Tamika McReynolds. I'm with the city of Jersey City. I'm actually on my cell phone because they're moving our office. So I just wanted to let everybody know I am here and I'm on my cell. I'm the 0062 and I wanted to say hello to everyone. Great, thank you so much. Anyone else? Great. All right, well, we are gonna kick it off um, with Ryan Kaufman. He is the tobacco policy and uh, tobacco Policy and Control Program Manager for the Philadelphia Department of Health. Um, and I will let him introduce himself and, uh, and take it away. Thank you so much, Katie and, and uh, Rebecca for having me here today and everyone else. It looks like such a great agenda and I uh, hope it's a really uh, empowering and thought-provoking uh, discussion you know, throughout the course of the afternoon and evening for everybody. So um, kindly, you know, Katie and Rebecca, you know, are amenable to allow me a few minutes to share an issue that we're thinking a lot about here in Philadelphia in the Department of Public Health. And I think an issue that doesn't, you know, get as much mention, you know, as is, um, as is warranted around the relationship or the perceived relationship between stress and tobacco use. And so uh, what I was gonna do is just share a little bit uh, in a brief presentation, hopefully there'll be some good time for discussion as well about this issue and really try to separate the fact you know, from, from the fiction about this issue. And so uh, with that, I'm gonna to try to share my screen here with everybody, uh, if I can get permission to do so. And then uh, you know, really wanna keep this pretty informal. So uh, please feel free as I go along, just to you know, ask some questions uh, that kind of come to mind and, and we'll just keep this as a, as a casual conversation if that works for everybody. It looks like uh, screen sharing is disabled at the moment. Uh, can we get that to him, please? Yep. Uh, one quick second. Sure, no problem. <laughs> Technology's fun. <laughs> yeah, sure is. <laughs> uh, all right. Um. There we go. All right, we're in business. So uh, with that, I'll share my screen here. As was mentioned uh, by Katie, you know, I'm with the Department of Public Health here in Philadelphia. I've been in the role about nine years. Uh, in addition to doing a lot of work on local um, tobacco control uh, in the city of Philadelphia, uh, I also am a tobacco treatment specialist. So I've been uh, treating tobacco use disorder for about 15, 20 years at this point. And so um, this is an issue that comes up a lot in the work that I do, both on the tobacco control side and the policy side, and also on you know, helping patients and community members as well. And so what we're gonna talk about is uh, the problem, not the solution, the first delusion, stress and tobacco use. So I think, um, I'm not saying anything sort of drastic by acknowledging that we are living through extremely challenging times, right? Whether it's the national debate that's underway and, and, and uh, reaching a fever pitch around uh, guns in our country, whether it's around COVID's sort of uh, ripple effect impacts that we're all still feeling all these years later and all the attendant sort of mental health uh, and substance use disorder uh, implications of these difficult times, right? Anxiety, stress, PTSD, depression, 
uh, phobias of various sorts. So this is just a very difficult time. And these are being laid on top of existing um, stress and trauma that some of the populations that are also experiencing the highest prevalence of tobacco use have been experiencing for decades. So as some folks on the call may be well aware, and others this may be important information to, to take in, you know, tobacco use uh, remains concentrated in some of our most vulnerable communities. You have folks with substance use disorders and mental illness, uh, low income populations and um, our veterans and LGBTQI plus communities still use tobacco at much higher rates than the general population overall. I'm hoping that this presentation is gonna be a little hazardous to your perceptions around stress and tobacco use. And uh, you know, the titles really comes from, I used to live in New England some years back. And so I uh, got really into all those transcendentalists, right? Folks like Thoreau and you know, uh, Emerson, uh, interesting, have a lot of interesting things to say, I think. But one of the most interesting things I think for today that uh, is a quote that a lot of folks aren't aware of that Emerson had said, and this was hundreds of years ago, right? Centuries ago, he had said that believing we do something when we do nothing is the first illusion of tobacco. So folks hundreds of years ago had a sense that tobacco use was not what it seems in terms of its effects and impacts on behavior, on mood, on how people feel. So this led me to really think, as I've been working in clinical settings, as I mentioned, for a number of years, you know, what do you guys think? You know, what's one of the biggest triggers and causes for relapse from tobacco use? What would you say? What's one of the biggest reasons that people use tobacco and one of the biggest reasons people go back to using tobacco after they're attempting their recovery from tobacco use? What do you think? Yeah, Jessica. Would that be um, trauma? Yeah, trauma and closely related to trauma is also stress, right? Right, right. Right answer right out of the gate. Way to go, Jessica. Yeah. So stress and trauma and, uh, you know, otherwise, you know, neg negative mood or emotional distress is a big reason. You, uh, you know, assemble a random group of people and ask them, what's the biggest reason people use tobacco? The biggest reason people go back? Answers like Jessica gave of like trauma and stress and just uh, you know, negative emotional well-being, things like that are often mentioned. Uh, in addition, when you really ask tobacco users about this, and I've probably talked about this to hundreds if not thousands of folks, right, is you know, does tobacco use manage stress, cope with stress, deal with stress on some level? Does it do that? Folks will often say, yeah, of course it does. I think, maybe. So you often get this, response that it has a little bit of hesitation and uncertainty in it as well, where tobacco users think that it does that and vapors as well. But then when you really ask, does it and how, their confidence about their answer starts to slip a little bit. But so where does this widespread belief come from that tobacco use manages stress? So what we're gonna to try to do in the time we have is comprehend the urgency to really clarify this relationship for what it is and it isn't. We'll take a little bit of a look at the literature uh, on the impact of tobacco use and stress. And we'll talk about the tobacco industry's role in promulgating or spreading this idea that tobacco use manages stress. And then we're gonna consider some different framing when discussing stress and tobacco use and tobacco treatment and culture change efforts. So here's what the data really says. When you really subject this to scientific scrutiny, Perceived stress is associated with greater odds of smoking. Stress is often cited as the primary reason for smoking, as Jessica sort of indicated or spoke to, and that higher and consistent stress levels are associated with the greater risk of relapsing to tobacco use. And this has real implications, right? When this belief takes hold and then in turn influences how providers, for instance, whether on the physical health side or behavioral health side provide care, this has real impacts on the type of care people are receiving and the health on the harmful impacts of tobacco use on those populations. So one area I do a lot of work in is around tobacco and behavioral health. And this was a really important study that looked at 38 other studies or over 16,000 different mental health professionals. And you're gonna see some of the key findings here about their most common beliefs and attitudes. But one thing I really wanted to hit upon is around 38%, so one in four, one in four mental health professionals said that basically quitting smoking is too stressful for their patients, that tobacco use is needed or necessary to help manage stress on some level. That's concerning. 
That's thousands and thousands of professionals that in turn see thousands and thousands of folks you know, with mental illness. And a lot of those providers, you know, not a small percentage really believe that smoking is necessary or needed to manage stress. And it's a, a stress management tool. But yet when you really dig in a little deeper, let's see how this starts to fall apart when you consider that about less than 20% of US adults use tobacco at this point. But 100% of folks experience stress in some form, whether that's financial, family, relationship stress. And that the literature goes on to say even further that uh, the stress levels of adult smokers report that they have higher levels of stress than non-smokers. So they actually perceive more stress in their lives. Very relevant for today's conversation, adolescents actually report that when they start becoming more addicted to tobacco, when they go from experimenting with tobacco use to becoming daily frequent tobacco users, they report increasing levels of stress in their lives as they become daily frequent smokers. Big, big finding that we talk about a lot is that there was a really huge uh, study that was also done that shows when people become tobacco free, they report a reduction in depression, anxiety, and stress and improved positive mood when they become tobacco free. So not that stress levels go up when people become tobacco free, but that they actually go down. That people are managing their stress in more healthy, productive ways when they become tobacco free. I know Truth Initiative, those great, great folks at Truth Initiative are going to speak a little bit later, but uh, also they looked recently at how this applies to vaping and found about half of young people who vape felt they were more in control when they were uh, not vaping as opposed to when they were. And 90%, 90%, 9 and 10 said they felt less stressed, anxious, and depressed when they were no longer vaping. So the same relationship is really holding true for vaping as well as uh, traditional tobacco use as well. So then that being said, what's really happening here? Because think about this, right? If everyone's saying, oh, I smoke because of stress or I use tobacco because of stress, I went back to smoking because of stress, but yet stress goes down rather than up when people become tobacco free, what's really happening? What's the true relationship? Well, actually tobacco use produces some very negative impacts on the body. Uh, as we all know, right? It affects every part of us head to toe, inside and out. Uh, there's a great infographic here. It causes you know, about a dozen cancers, as well as a whole slew of other effects on the human body. But one of the things we like to hone in on as it pertains to stress is it actually produces a lot of effects that make us more stressed and anxious, right? It increases our blood pressure and our heart rate. It causes uh, a tensing of muscles, a constricting of blood vessels a decrease in the uh, levels of oxygen available to our bodies. So immediately, you know, it has actually the opposite intended effect on relieving stress, but it goes a bit deeper. What actually happens is it comes all down to tobacco withdrawal. So tobacco withdrawal begins in as little as a couple of hours after someone's last tobacco product use and sort of worsens over time the longer someone is not using tobacco. And so tobacco users will often confuse a temporary removal of te uh, tobacco withdrawal symptoms with the feeling of stress relief. So actually, and this is, this is backed up by further research evidence that shows that tobacco use actually increases stress levels because you have a need to constantly use tobacco to avoid tobacco withdrawal. And I'll show you a good example of this in a second. And let's not, you know, thumb our noses at how significant these effects are. So tobacco withdrawal, again, begins uh, within a few hours after someone's last tobacco use. And the heavier the tobacco product user, the more severe their withdrawal often is. And these are the symptoms of tobacco withdrawal. So irritability, frustration, anger, anxiety can feel a lot like stress and stress symptoms, right? And that um, what's also important is that when we're reducing the withdrawal symptoms, the stressor doesn't go away. So I'll give you a quick example. You get an argument with your, uh, your boyfriend or girlfriend or spouse or what have you. You can go outside and smoke as many cigarettes as you want. That argument or that um, resolution of that argument is still waiting for you back inside. That hasn't changed. So tobacco use actually doesn't really change the stressor that made us upset in the first place. If we're just getting outside the situation, getting a little time out, doing some distraction or delay, 
there's a million ways to do that that don't involve tobacco use. Further backing this up is uh, this other researcher found that as people become um, tobacco users, that their mood patterns, they've, they, have, they report more normal moods when they're smoking and a worsening of their moods between cigarettes. So this actually, again, further supports the idea that all you're doing when you're smoking is we're confusing the feeling of withdrawal management removal temporarily with stress relief, which it is clearly not. Here's a great way to look at this. And you may remember or heard about the myth of Sisyphus. This is a piece of Greek myth where essentially a guy is pushing a big boulder up a hill and back down and up and back and up and back. That's his sort of punishment for eternity in this Greek myth. That's actually what happens with tobacco use. So if you look at this, what you're seeing at the tail end here uh, in the latter part of the day is your nicotine levels basically plummet overnight. So we wake up in drug withdrawal. That's why a lot of people report the first cigarette of the day is the one they anticipate the most. So you smoke and you quickly bring those levels back up and then they quickly go back down. You smoke to bring them back up, back down, up, down, up, down, up, down. That's all someone's doing all day long when they smoke. So rather what they're really doing is trying desperately to keep out a drug withdrawal. Because as long as you stay in that gray zone, you're not an active withdrawal. But when you drop below that, that's when you start experiencing withdrawal symptoms. So I show this to my patients and I say, does this look stressful? And they're like, yeah, it actually really does. And that, that is what I feel each and every day. So just again, really showing what's really happening when you use tobacco or not use tobacco and, 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 and are experiencing withdrawal symptoms, how much of a punishment that really is you know, over the course of many days, weeks, months, years in the life of someone who's using tobacco. Here's another infographic that kind of puts, brings this all together, right? So when you use tobacco, it, it lifts your nicotine levels temporarily, but then you start to experience withdrawal symptoms and that you try to relieve those withdrawal symptoms by using tobacco, but that only lasts temporarily. Soon after you finish using that tobacco product, the levels start to drop back down again. You try to smoke another cigarette to bring them back up before those withdrawal symptoms set in again. So this whole idea of smoking for stress relief has really become confused you know, with tobacco withdrawal. So that brings up a very interesting question. Where do all these beliefs come from? How do we then, so many of us, millions of us, believe that smoking relieves stress? No shocker here, it's the tobacco industry. And a lot of this dates back to a really interesting point in time where there was a very influential, well-known researcher named Hans Selye who uh, was known as the father of stress at, at one point in time. And internal tobacco industry documents show that he received extensive tobacco industry funding that he never disclosed for being a tobacco industry consultant. His research focused on stress and health and was used in uh, lawsuits uh, for years and years to defend the tobacco industry's interests. Uh, and it wasn't really until about the late 90s that a lot of this research and internal documents started to come forward, showing that unfortunately this well-known researcher uh, was in the pockets of the tobacco industries, helping them to shape this narrative that tobacco use relieves stress. This is actually an internal document uh, uh, related to Dr. Sellier's work from the tobacco industry, showing how they were fine-tuning and honing their basically lie that tobacco use relieves stress. So this was a classic and still to, to this date, a strategy the tobacco industry uses a lot is trying to get scientists and uh, research and social scientists to parrot their views to preserve their profits. Here's yet another one. Uh, this is an internal document from tobacco, uh, the tobacco industry uh, company, RJ Reynolds at the time. And you're seeing this underlined points just outlining very clearly them trying to shop around this idea of tobacco use as a form of self-medication for stress. Here's yet another one. So you see just how long they've been at work on this internally, trying to uh, shape this argument, which then they use another very powerful tool at their disposal, unfortunately, to get this out into mainstream society. And that is media. So what they did is paid scientists and used internal documents to strategize this particular point, and then they blasted this out across the country for decades with marketing. 
So look at all of these ads. And what you're seeing here is them trying to connect the use of their product to relieving stress, improving your disposition, reducing anxiety, all of these things. And they were working on this for decades, seeding you know, minds and hearts across the country, so much so that now you look at an average room of individuals and ask about stress and tobacco use and everyone will tell you, oh yeah, it absolutely relieves, relieves stress. When that really doesn't bear out to be true when you look at this more closely. They did this not only for the general population, but they also targeted veterans, for instance, who endured a lot of stress when they were in active combat. So for decades and decades and decades, it was a million dollars an hour approximately just putting out marketing material after marketing material with this idea. And you notice that no one ever looks stressed in a tobacco ad. Isn't that mysterious? Everyone is always cool, calm, collective. Nobody is ever stressed in a tobacco ad. When in actuality, you know, given the high rates of tobacco use among populations that experience a lot of day-to-day -day stress, this should be a real tobacco ad on the left, showing that you know, someone is trying desperately to come to grips with anxiety, stress, trauma, PTSD in their lives, and the tobacco industry is selling them a fake line, essentially that tobacco use relieves that stress that they're experiencing. There's a musician uh, who said this really great, the true face of smoking um, is disease, death, and horror, not the glamour and sophistication pushers in the tobacco industry try to portray. And also not surprising, the vaping industry is doing the very same thing. This is a particularly heinous uh, ad put out by uh, Puff Bar, actually. And what you're seeing here, this is directed absolutely at young people, youth and young adults, saying, stay sane with Puff Bar, the solar break. It's the perfect escape from back-to-back -back Zoom calls, parental stress, and work from home stress. So not surprisingly, the tobacco industry did this for years, and the vaping industry is following suit and trying to connect their products use to, um, you know, to uh, stress relief. Um, and they're doing the exact same thing. I think another important point as we wrap up to highlight of how this view of stress and smoking became so prevalent is in movies. There's a great film director once who said, every film is the result of the society that produces it. So for decades and decades, you see depictions of smoking in movies where someone who is upset or anxious or high strung is often using tobacco. Here's a great example of a few screenshots from different movies. Look at this one on the upper right. What do you say we sneak out for a quick smoke and calm those nerves? So remember movies are seen by millions of people over the years. And this is not just true for the silver screen, this is also true for streaming. Some of you may be watching Stranger Things season four. It's awesome, just finished it last night, but that notwithstanding, you know, there's also been rightly so a lot of scrutiny about how often smoking is depicted in um, streaming content uh, for youth and young adults. And uh, fortunately, Netflix is starting to rein that in a little bit, but you know, think how much Winona Ryder, when she was really upset you know, in the early seasons of Stranger Things was smoking prolifically during that time. So, and what I'm basically saying, my personal view, it was a lot of internal tobacco industry um, strategizing paying research scientists, but then it was the marketing. And then I think movies really had a strong part to play in why this belief is so prevalent. This is in another internal document where they try to place their products in movies with pleasant situations. And we've approached films that we believe would be very beneficial to a subliminal product campaign. So this is openly acknowledging that they're trying to connect smoking to uh, depictions of people that are experiencing stress relief in movies or are calm and in control in movies. These are directly the words of the tobacco industry. So what can we do in wrapping up about this issue? Well, there's a few things I think individually. I think about this as a treatment professional. I try all the time to incorporate stress management into the development of healthy and productive coping skills and relapse prevention when I'm providing behavioral treatment. So we recognize with patients, I'll say to them, if stress is gonna happen whether we use tobacco or not, let's talk about ways that we can cope or manage or deal with stress that are healthy and productive rather than harmful and unproductive? How do we acknowledge that stress is gonna happen whether we use tobacco or not? And what stress can be removed from our lives? So remember some stress, I mean, for instance, COVID-19 and gun violence, and unfortunately has become chronic sources of stress in our society. But I'll work with individual patients and I'll often say, okay, if you're telling me every time I talk to my sister on the phone, 
oh, it just makes me incredibly stressed out. How can we find ways to mediate those interactions, send more text messages, have our calls be a little bit shorter so that it doesn't produce the stress, which in turn produces the cravings and withdrawal symptoms for tobacco use. And I would really encourage folks from this conversation today to share, think about this as it applies to themselves, but also share with their loved ones, aunts, uncles, fathers, mothers, brothers that are struggling with tobacco use and may very well still think that this relationship is what it isn't to share this true relationship between stress and tobacco use with them. I work with a lot of organizations and one, especially in the behavioral health space, as I mentioned, and those are another space where you have to find other ways to stay alive when we're taking five, right? Is challenge the assertion that treating tobacco use is too, and tobacco free settings are too stressful. As you saw in that earlier research study with mental health professionals, this is desperately needed. And then familiarize ourselves with the independent peer reviewed literature, not what the tobacco industry is putting out, uh, which has its own agenda, but with the, the independent peer reviewed scientific literature and identify other activities and programming that manage stress in a healthy and productive ways. Rather than having several smoke breaks a day, how can we have walking groups or art therapy groups instead? And highlight the role of the tobacco industry in promoting tobacco use as self-medication for stress. So in conclusion, when we use tobacco or vape to relieve stress, we're momentarily removing tobacco withdrawal symptoms, which is confused for stress relief and tobacco and vaping use increases stress in tobacco users. Tobacco users are basically using tobacco to feel normal, i.e. not in withdrawal, and which in turn maintains their addiction. There's a great saying in AA that when I stopped living the problem and I began living the answer, the problem went away. And tobacco use and vaping is a harmful, unproductive coping strategy for stress. It adds fuel to the fire rather than extinguishes the fire. It's really the problem, not the solution for stress. And we all must strive to create tobacco and vape-free care settings and incorporate healthy and productive stress management strategies into services and into programming, into a recovery from tobacco. This is my contact information here. If folks have any questions from today, feel free to email me. I'll put this in the chat as well. And with that, you know, if there's time, I'm uh, happy to answer any questions that folks may have. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ryan. Um, I always learn so much, even from when we talked the other day about some of this stuff. Um, I just think it's really fascinating. Um, we will be doing breakouts here in a moment, um, but before we do, does anybody have any thoughts uh, before we go into those rooms? We'll talk about it there anyway, so. Okay, great. Uh, well, thank you all again so much. And thank you all for those of you who had just um, come on. Um, all right, uh, what is it? We, what are the parameters for subliminal messages? Yeah, so uh, I think, I mean, I'm speculating here. I, I try not to crawl into the heads of the tobacco industry any more than I need to. But I think what they're referring to is how they try to associate their product right, with uh, certain types of characters and certain types of behaviors in movies. So um, let's see, what's a good example of this? Um, you know, and, and granted, uh, it's important, do all, do many types of uh, companies who make consumer products do this? Uh, Craig and Kim, absolutely. But what we're talking about here that's really important is that this is a lethal addictive drug. This is the only consumer product that if used is directed by the manufacturer kills up to half its users. So this is very different than if we're talking about, you know, iPhones or tennis shoes or something like that in movies. So a good example of this that I would, I would bring to mind, you know, is uh, in Avatar. Do you guys ever remember the first Avatar movie? It was a global blockbuster, right? It was seen by scores, legions of people, especially children. And there's a scene in that movie when Sigourney Reaver comes out of some type of suspended animation and she says, where's my blank, blank cigarette? She's an environmental scientist in the future. She's, they're trying to show her as being stressed and upset. And then she doesn't really smoke at all in the rest of the movie. No one else smokes in the entire movie in this future setting. So it begs a question of why is this even in here to begin with? So that was unfortunately the decision of the director at the time. But the internal documents show us that the tobacco industry paid directors, paid actors and actresses 
to use their products in certain scenes in movies, whether that's to show them being macho, but they've also subliminally did that to connect their product to the relieving of stress or to show that someone is a calm, collected character, like a villain, for instance, who was sinister, but also just kind of, you know, quietly plotting the whole time. So those, I think, are some of the examples of the subliminal messages that the tobacco industry tried to, you know, is well documented to have inserted in movies over the decades. Does that, that help answer your question? Yes, thank you. Sure. Great. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Um, and we will be having a little, a couple minutes after um, to go back and, and talk with everybody as a big group um, about this, as we'll be doing um, for each of our presenters. Um, and thank you so much to Ryan and everybody who is presenting for staying out for these questions. Um, so right now, um, Rebecca, do you want to kick everybody uh, off to the breakouts? All right. Well, as we are starting to have everybody come back in, um, what are some thoughts everybody has? We, we got to go real quick because we're about to get you guys back into some stuff. But real quick, are there any takeaway thoughts before we, we go on to, to what we're going to do about all this? Awesome. If anybody has any questions or anything as we go, definitely always let us know. Uh, we're going to kind of move around fast. We want to make sure that your time is precious. We want to make sure we're not getting over anything. Um, so um, definitely reach out to any of us if you have any questions. Uh, also, kind reminder um, to mute now that we've been talking and all this stuff, kind reminder to mute um, while people are presenting. I think everybody's back. Hope you guys got a lot out of that. Um, we will be continuing to talk about things. So definitely, um, if you didn't feel like you had your moments in there, conversation will keep going. So we are moving on. All right. Okay, Katie. You're fine. Thank you. All right. Over to giving you guys the giveaway. Great. So next up is Rebecca and I um, talking about grassroots and just, you know, what we're here for. And not only are we talking about those important issues um, that Ryan had talked about, not only are we talking about um, you know, all the different aspects of tobacco, but we're also talking about what, what you can do about it. So, um, you know, that's kind of where we are. So anybody want to take a stab at what grassroots advocacy means? And if you know, don't say, I mean, if you like, if you work in grassroots. Like, All right, well, won't make you be brave this time. Grassroots advocacy is recruiting, educating, and engaging advocates to contact decision makers and advance a policy issue. Uh, so we do that in a lot of different ways. Uh, you know, we work on, um, you know, people meeting together on a lot of different issues. As you can see, people met in person uh, quite a few years ago, uh, but now we're coming back at it. We've been meeting virtually with uh, young advocates. And then now that we are out and about, um, some of our great advocates are coming out and um, helping us at tables and talking about issues that are happening um, in their community. So that's, um, that's what we're talking about here. So what is a grassroots action? Um, there are a lot of different ways we're gonna be doing this. 
Um, you can use action alerts, social media posts, phone calls, meetings, letters, interviews, trainings, sharing your story, and, and really quite a bit more. You know, this is really about making sure that people are um, talking about, you know, what, what the issues are and, and being as creative as possible. As we know, you know, just through seeing the world, the more experiential you are, the more, um, you know, the more you stand out sometimes, the more it really uh, makes a difference. So it's really important. Rebecca, you want to talk about action alerts? Sure. So action alerts, uh, when you're a part of um, the Year of the Cure network, you'll see emails come from us and sometimes also text messages asking you to like take part in, um, in an alert. And what we're alerting our uh, people about are uh, bills that are moving through state houses. So I know that we have New Jersey on the line. Um, so an example for New Jersey is we are working really hard to close the loophole to make sure that um, casinos are actually smoke-free as well. Um, it's been 15 years since the Smoke-Free Act has passed in New Jersey, and that is the sitting loophole is in Atlantic City for all the, um, the casinos to allow for smoking to happen. So that's a really easy thing when you sign up with Year of the Cure, which I hope you all have. If not, yearthecure.org. Uh, you know, those are the types of things that you'll be getting just to kind of see, you know, it's very quick. It's very quick. You know, you just click and take action. And those are the real things that make sure that um, legislators and decision makers are, are know what um, know what we care about and know that particularly in this issue, um, we really need to do something about tobacco use and making sure that we're protecting what we can. Um, social media, this one's a big one. Uh, it is not just for likes. It is not just for selling, for showing your lunch or your really cute new hat, which is fabulous. Uh, but it is also for making sure that you are generating buzz around an issue, making sure that, you know, people know kind of where you stand on things. Um, you know, we see that with a lot of things, especially if there's, you know, some, you know, hot topic that's going on or something, but we can do that through policies too. We can do that with issues as well. So, um, you know, showing your friends where you're going, what you're doing, what you're worried about, and videos, making sure that you're, you know, you're posting social media things. Um, you are an influencer. I don't care if you have, you know, one follower or one million followers, you are an influencer um, to your friends and the people around you. So very important um, that we're using social media, um, especially, you um, as youth, um, you know, you, as you know, that's where the conversation is. So it's very, very important to use that and to show your support on those uh, those uh, apps and, and programs. And to add one more thing onto the social media part, um, studies have shown that as little as like five tweets at a lawmaker can really make a difference because they're not used to getting tweeted at. Uh, I can tell you, even from personal experience, I like to tweet at my lawmakers, and one of them actually follows me. Actually, I think both of them do. Um, and I don't have that many followers. Yeah, it, it really does make a difference. Because, like, and, and the thing is, too, is a lot, especially um, with, like, Twitter and Instagram, it's frequently the um, decision maker themselves who is managing that um, that site. You know, sometimes, especially with more of the federal or the larger um, uh, decision makers, you know, they might have somebody kind of helping them with that. But especially if it's state or local, um, more times than not, it is somebody who is uh, who is the person themselves. And the other action that uh, we're asking folks to do and you can do very easily is make a phone call. I know it can be a little bit scary, but uh, the likelihood is, is it's gonna make a huge impact because people are actually afraid to get on the phone and talk to the legislator and let them know. But I've heard from countless legislators saying that they're not experts. They're looking for people who are passionate about an issue and they wanna know your story. So the easiest way is to pick up the phone, dial them, and leave a voice message. The likelihood is, is you will not get somebody in person. You'll just get a, a voice message, and you can just let them know that you're in support or against a policy that they're, uh, they're going to vote on. Yeah, and having those calls, 
Um, you know, and I really, I really want to echo to what Rebecca said about story. Um, you know, stories are really what makes it work. You know, I mean, think about, think about math class, right? Um, I don't know about you. I'm not really good with that, but you know, do I remember, you know, the formula or do I remember the story? You know, the story is really, there's a reason why there's story problems. You know, you can really kind of see how that applies. Um, and, you know, people want to hear your story. They want to hear why heart health is important to you, how it's impacted you, how it's impacted your life, the life of a loved one. Um, so it's, it's really important. Again, as we're talking about, share your story. Um, you know, what brought you to the Heart Association? What brought you to tobacco um, policy work? What, what, why is this a passion for you? Um, you know, it really helps legislators uh, really empathize with you. Actually, this happened to me yesterday of um, talking about um, CPR policy that we were really sure a legislator was going to um, have our side on it, but we uh, had a had a advocate meet with them, and it really seems like um, they're more supportive of us because they really heard a compelling story and heard how that would save their life. So, really makes a big difference. in-person meetings we're back we get to do in-person meetings again um it is the single most powerful way to connect and persuade legislators to support policy priorities um, and you really have an opportunity to meet your elected officials and, and share their stories and make sure that they understand why these policies are important to you um you know it really it really does make a difference um if you know if you don't feel comfortable meeting in person or you have some sort of um mobility or time or uh, transportation uh, hindrances that make meeting in person difficult for you. Um, you can always do a virtual event and you know we're happy to help you uh, coordinate these events, have these meetings. And then also if you um, are in an organization who want to um, set up events with, with a legislator, we are happy to help you help you with that and make sure that you um, and your organization, friends and your community are able to really meet um, with your legislators and able to talk about these issues. So uh, the one thing before you meet with your lawmakers, you may wanna do a little bit of homework. Uh, maybe see Google is a really effective tool um, and a lot of legislators and elected officials do put their story out there, where they came from, how they got started, what they're fighting for, um, what organizations they even work with and what awards. So doing just a little bit of homework um, ahead of time to prepare yourself um, and let them know you know, that you've, you've done your research on them kind of goes, oh, well, they pay a little bit more attention. Um, also doing small things. So after meeting with a lawmaker, having like sending them a quick little email saying, hey, it was great to meet with you. I really appreciate you taking your time. And then just signing your name. Um, you can also tag them in a social media post. They love having their pictures uh, posted on there that they've met, especially with young folks. Um, they, they feel, um, like they're leaving a legacy there, especially when uh, when they're meeting with younger people. Um, so yeah, you know, it's really just about making sure that you know. And this doesn't have to be some big, you know, research paper, or anything like that. You know, we're just talking about just having sort of a general idea of, of who they are, what they're about, where you might have those connections. Um, you know, did they, you know, does their, does their kid go to school with you? Does, you know, were they also a lacrosse player? Um, you know, any number of things that, you know, can really show, you know, oh, hey, I'm, you know, I'm connecting with you there um, can really make a big difference. Um, so any questions on that? Excellent. Let me take his job getting this stuff back on track. Um, so let's uh, head back into those breakouts. 
have a couple of minutes talking about um, kind of the idea of advocacy, some ideas you may have, um, thoughts, what you may have done in the past, what you think works, what you think doesn't work, questions, all that kind of good stuff. So if we could get those breakout rooms back together and head on back to those, um, please go back to the breakout room that you were in before and make sure that you, when you close out the room, you are closing out the room and not the entire event. Um, so yeah, let's get to it. <clears throat> well, while we're all filing back, uh, does anybody have any thoughts or anything that they came away with uh, during the breakout session conversations that were going on? Love to hear it. I'll come off mute. Is that, is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> we, um, we had middle school and high school group and um, we had um, people share that, you know, if we don't speak up, then, you know, who will? So that was one of the um, just kind of points. And then I also wanted to encourage our young people that, um, and, and people of all ages that, um, you know, we, when we talk to legislators and people, that um, are passing policies that we're not really bugging them. That's what they, this is what they want to do. This is what they signed up to do. And so, um, yeah, just kind of come at it from that perspective uh, and be, be confident that they are here to help us and they want to hear us and they want to hear our voice. So that helps me when I get <laughs> intimidated sometime to talk to people. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. You know, it's about, um, as I always say, uh, legislators are just people with interesting jobs uh, and their job is to help us. Their job is to take care of us. You know, I think a lot of times um, there has been a false narrative that has been promoted about elected officials and about decision makers that they don't really care and they're just in it for the paycheck and the power and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I, I really don't find that to be true. I've been doing this for any number of years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we really want to make sure that we are, um, you know, doing some really great uh, work and making sure that, you know, that people are hearing from us. You know, that's, that's what they're here for. <laughs> why we pay them to be honest um and so you know let's let's do it let's make sure that they know where our voices are especially young voices because this is your life this is your world this is your future um you know so we definitely want to make sure that we're, we're doing that other thoughts Um. Great. All right. So any last thoughts before we move on to our, our next presentation? Okay, well, moving on, um, I'll just remind, remember everybody to mute during our presenters. Um, next up, we have a really great uh, presentation for you. Oh, wait, are we having a break? We have a really great uh, presentation for you. Um, <clears throat> this year, as a part of our tobacco end game work, we have had a presentation for World No Tobacco Day. Uh, we had a bit of a competition and a presentation for uh, World No Tobacco Day where we were soliciting um, art uh, from uh, 
local artists and um, supporters. So um, it's been really great in young artists. So um, we are lucky enough to have one of the uh, winners of the World No Tobacco Day contest, uh, Zara Nadim. Zara is the leader of our um, uh, American Heart Association affiliate group at Hunter College in New York. And uh, we're very excited to have her. And uh, she's going to show you her art, and what inspired it, and, um, and talk about um, a creative way to talk about these issues. So, Zara, take it Yep. Thank you so much, Katie, for the wonderful introduction. So hi, everyone. Uh, for the World No Tobacco Day contest, I actually submitted a poem. And the title of my poem is The Battle. And it represents the battle our youth and adolescents are facing with the prevalent and raging vaping epidemic. And it also describes how vaping and tobacco have had detrimental effects on our health and how it's marketed to be deceptive. And so I'll read my poem aloud for you guys, unless Katie, do you want me to share my screen to show the poem? Oh, Katie, you're muted. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, just so if people are visual learners, but uh, yeah, we just, we'd love to hear it. All right, okay. So let me just open it up. Okay, I'll start sharing my screen. All right, I hope you guys can see it. Okay, perfect. So the battle, everything seems out of focus. Toxic vapors consuming my soul. Their stench makes my mind run in circles. Can't tell my left from my right. Knocking out my senses to see, feel, and even breathe. Feeling trapped with those bright colors and colorful flavors. It's all a deception. Makes me feel high, yet brings me to an all-time low. Took the fall one too many times. Nevertheless, we will overcome the vape. Fight back till its end. A battle is never won when done alone. We can unite to overthrow this relentless regime. Rise together to create a better future, not letting the smoke blur our vision anymore. I hope you guys like that poem and I'll stop sharing. Um, and yeah, I would love to get your guys' input on it. Thank you so much, Sarah. Yeah, I'd love to hear uh, people's thoughts on it. What makes you think, um, makes you feel, et cetera. Yeah, Jessica, can you say more about uh, it being so insightful to you? I thought that the poem really described um, the allure of vaping, the colorful flavors and the colors. It seems very, um, it seems like a solution to a lot of problems like mental health, but also it just feels good, it tastes good, but it's really not as good as it seems. So I thought it was really insightful and helped reduce the positive image that vaping has. Thanks, Jessica. Yeah, Peyton, I really love that. Um, yeah, really got to the truth and point. Um, Zara, uh, you were asked if people could have a copy of it. Would that be all right? Yes, of course. I can like awesome. send it to you, Katie. And then do you want to email it to all the participants of the call? Yeah, we'll make sure that we add it to the uh, to the notes and things that we send after. All right, sounds good. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great. Well, moving on um, for our action pack schedule, we have um, some great presenters coming up. Let me get back to sharing my screen. Okay, so talking about the flavors, um, it's a really good um, segue into uh, talking with our next presenters, uh, Mario Fuchs and Diana Rao um, from the Philadelphia Health Promotion Council. Um, and they will be talking about their work on uh, tobacco flavors and uh, why it's an issue that we should all um, also be interested in. So. Hi all, thanks for having us today. Sounds like you all been having some really awesome conversations and we're really glad to be here. Can you all see my screen? 
Awesome. So my name is Arielle. I'm with the Advocacy Institute, and I'm here with an awesome peer coach with the Advocacy Institute, Diana. Diana, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. I'm Diana. I'm a peer coach with the Advocacy Institute, and I work with Ms. Ariel, and I just love it here. Awesome. Can you all hear us okay? Yes. Okay, awesome. So we are calling in today from Philadelphia. We're excited to share with you a little bit about our work. Um, one of the programs today that we'll be highlighting and some of what we do um, is through our hashtag Real Talk Tobacco program. And again, we're the Advocacy Institute. So we're gonna keep it interactive today. So feel free to unmute yourself or write in the chat, whatever you're comfortable with. Um, but we're gonna talk a little bit about flavored products, which it sounds like you all have been talking about already. And then we're also going to have some advertisements that we are going to walk you all through as well. So go ahead and write in the chat or unmute yourself. Who knows um, what this product is on the left? I have a feeling you all definitely know what these are. But um, yeah, if you want to shout out what the product is on the left and on the right, go ahead and unmute yourself or just type it in the chat. Jewel, yep. You got it. And then the one on the right. And a puff bar. Awesome. Yes. Thank you, Zara and Jessica. So, you know, you can, I've heard all of you talking about the bright colors and flavors already. You know, Jewel definitely had a lot of flavored products on the market. They still do. Um, we've been doing a lot of work around that in Philadelphia. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And then as you can see, this flavor also just says blueberry ice here on puff bar. Um, it's pretty um, obvious flavor. And we know that um, often flavored products are targeting who? Go ahead and type it in the chat. Adolescents. Yep, young people. Um, Katie says the pollution really gets me with all these products. Definitely. Um, that's a really good point that these products um, are not great for our environment and especially the plastics definitely build up in our environment. So we just wanted to show you a couple pictures of what we've been up to in Philly and things that we're advocating um, against right now. So um, as you can see, this is actually a local tobacco store in Philadelphia and one of our youth leaders took this picture, um, but these are cigars and other tobacco products. And then what do you all see right next to it? Candy? Candy. Yep, definitely. Um, Kit Kats, Twix. So, you know, um, we definitely like to call that out when we see it in stores because um, who usually eats candy? Children. Yeah, it's a little bit more marketing to young people, right, than adults. And um, young people technically can't buy. Um, products that are um, the tobacco products. And then another issue we are working on in Philly that we're fighting against is this is a store that sells tobacco and this is an elementary school right across the street. Um, and in Philadelphia, to stores that sell tobacco are allowed to be 500 feet from a school, but we feel like that's too close. So we actually have a campaign called 500 feet is still too close and are working on that issue. And then as you can see, this is an elementary school student and what's right at his eye level? He's waiting for someone at a corner store, a convenience store in his community. What do you all see there? Tobacco um, logo, label. Yep, or logos, brand. labels and advertisement, right? And so that's right at his eye level. If they're not trying to sell products to young people and to children, why, does that, why is that at his eye level and not an adult's eye level, right? Something to think about. And these are also some slides that one of our youth leaders um, created just showing you, you know, honestly, the tobacco industry, they know what they're doing. They have products comparable to juice boxes used by children, Skittles, right? More of that candy theme. Diana, anything to add? Yeah, and they use, and you would think they would use rare flavors, but they use flavors that, like, you know, when you go to the store, they know teens and, you know, kids eat stuff like 
Sour Patch Kids and have different cookies and flavors and stuff. And, you know, like, if they see, like, other teens and their friends doing it, they're going to want to do the same thing because a lot of times, like, young te- like teens um, and young kids get peer pressure by other kids to do things. Definitely. Like Diana said, there com- they are some products that replicate Sour Patch Kids and um, they change some of the logos. And it's honestly really confusing. And that's one of their um, marketing tactics for flavored products. So before we move on to one of our activities, any questions or comments so far? I just want to say, I've definitely seen this, you know, being from Philly, you know, I've definitely seen um, some of these products just on the street, just as litter and thought that it was one thing and then looked and, and realized it was the other. So, you know, I mean, even just walking around, you know, those of you who know Philly know it could be filthy Delphia, um, you know, and, you know, you definitely could look down and see a lot of these things, um, you know, just looking at them from afar, I get confused. So it's easy to think that, um, you know, they know what they're doing because fooled me. Mm -hmm. And this is a part, I know you all have been talking a lot about advocacy today. And a lot of what we do is go and talk with our local and state legislators. And a lot of the times they don't know that this is happening. You know, Katie's saying walking around Philadelphia, she sees this, you know, in certain areas or her community, but a lot of legislators don't know that this is happening. So part of what we do is we educate them on what's happening, you know, in our city so that they're aware and can, um, help to um, develop policies that will protect young people from this type of targeting. So now we're gonna look at some advertisements and we're gonna talk a little bit more about targeting and we wanna know for these ads, we're gonna show you one cigarette ad and one e-cigarette ad. And so we wanna know, we're gonna ask you some questions. So feel free to jump in the chat again or just unmute yourself. But who do you think the audience is that they're trying to reach for these ads? And it just goes to show you, you know, this is a cigarette ad from a while back when cigarettes, um, you know, perhaps were the tobacco product, but now we know it's more Juul and e-cigarettes and so their advertisements are very similar, you will notice. So for both of these, what do you, who do you think they're trying to target? Couples, yeah, thanks Diana. Mm-hmm. Young you adults. Think? Young adults, yeah. Mm-hmm. Because so they're trying to replace the older adults that were hooked on cigarettes. So they have to get a whole new generation hooked. And they know exactly what they're doing. And it's perfectly legal for them to do that. Absolutely, Bernadette. That's a really important point. I think it's showing impressionable teenagers that smoking is cool, that it is something like it's just in his fingers while he's kissing a girl it's so casual absolutely yeah you answered the next two questions thank you for that yeah that where they want you to believe that you know you'll be cool and have these awesome makeout sessions if you jewel or if you smoke right um but we know that it's just advertising and also, um, you know, the elements that they're using, like you said, that they're making it effortless, carefree to have a jewel in your hand while you're, you know, with your significant other. So things to keep in mind. Thanks all for the participation. And I'll let Diana take the next one. Okay, um, can everybody hear me um, loud and clear, Miss Ariel? It's a little low. I don't know if you could talk into the computer. Um, I'm sorry, can y'all hear me now? It's still a little low, but I could hear you. All right, I'm gonna try to talk as loud as I can. Um, so this is kind of similar to the um, last one that Miss um, Ariel just did. So what do you notice, um, who is the audience they're trying to reach in this picture um, with the jewel and the cigarette one this time? Uh, we got in the chat young adults teens yeah yeah a lot with teens um for our second question 
what do they want the viewer to think or believe about the product? That it's fun, that it's cool. Yeah, you notice that. And um, and if you notice in the Jewel one, they got like the friends all together and in the Newport one, um, you notice that like family members are kind of like taking pictures together, like that's um, cool and okay. Thank you. Um, and for our last uh, question, what elements are used in these pictures to target the audience? Oh, yeah, makes it cool. Um, gives you friends, yeah, thank you. Um, and for our last question, what elements are used in these pictures to target the audience? There's a lot of bright colors. Yeah, bright colors, I agree. Yep. Um, I noticed that on a Newport one, I think it's like a little selfie, like like they taking a picture, like a cell phone on there. Like, hey, other people should do it too. Yep, definitely. Yep. And I want everyone to keep in mind for the next one, this um, advertisement here is a menthol advertisement. Um, and you'll notice, um, next, can I go to the next slide, Diana? Anything else you wanna add? No, I think I have to cover everything. Thank you. Awesome. So um, another thing that we are advocating against here in Philadelphia, um, before we get to our other ads, we just wanted to highlight that, you know, it's a definitely really pervasive issue here in Philadelphia, menthol. Has anyone heard of menthol as a flavored product before? And no, like yeah, what so flavor it's associated with? Oh, go ahead. Bernadette, was that you? Yeah, I have. Um, menthol it makes the cigarette smoother to smoke. It diminishes the harshness of the cigarette and it encourages deeper inhalations so that um, there's more of a chance of um, illnesses over long-term use. Yep, exactly. Um, and it's also more likely to, to get teens addicted to um, their products when it's a menthol product. And menthol is associated with the green types of advertising and packaging. Um, it's a minty flavor. Um, and like Bernadette said, it, it minimizes the harshness of smoke on, on one's throat. Um, and it's everywhere, but specifically here in Philadelphia, Black communities are really targeted by menthol companies and brands specifically. Um, and the communities are more likely to be inundated with menthol products and advertisements. And we've even had young people say in our program that they've had um, mailings sent to their house, um, to their address with, um, with advertisements for menthol products or um, their grandparents smoked um, menthol products specifically. So advertising, as you can see, um, you know, they kind of take advantage and there's uh, have advertising here that even says cool salutes black history month. This is really specific advertising. And, you know, in Philadelphia, uh, we are fighting against this and um, trying to get menthol um, restricted as a flavor. And there's also some really great initiatives. If you're interested in advocacy, in this area, there is an opportunity right now to submit a comment or your story to the FDA um, because they're taking comments right now to uh, eliminate menthol nationwide. So um, that's definitely a really great advocacy opportunity if you all are interested. Any questions or thoughts about menthol before we wrap up? I know we just have a couple more minutes. All right, well, we have one more advertisement. Diana, I'll let you take it away with this one. Okay, so for our last one, um, you might know these two people, two celebrities, but um, for this one, um, who do you think the audience is trying, um, who do you think the audience, like audiences they're trying to reach with these two um, pictures? Adolescents. particularly adolescents of color. Sorry. 
Can you hear us, Diana? I'm sorry, my internet just had went out for a minute. Can you repeat that again? I, I can hear now. Um, okay, for our next question, um, what do um, they want the viewer to think or believe about their product? I'd say that it's like, you know, something that celebrities use, you know, it's the, you know, preferred choice of celebrities or, or however you want to put that. Yeah, I agree. I feel like a lot of times because of celebrities, many kids and many teens look up to them. So they feel like, oh, well, if my favorite celebrity is doing it, for example, Gucci Mane, or like if y'all know Ariana Grande or one of them, if y'all, if some kids see them doing it, then they think it's cool for them to do it also. So yeah, I agree. Any other thoughts? Anybody else? Okay, um, moving on to our last question. What elements are used in these pictures to target the audience? Bright lights, they're smiling. Yeah, I agree. The bright lights are smiling. The fact, if y'all look at picture one, if you notice, it says uh, Swisher Sweets, like the whole like little logo thingy is up on the back while she's performing and while she's singing. And in the Gucci main one, you could tell that um, it's a little logo of the Swisher Sweets in there. And it looks like it's his album or like his um, little flyer to come to his concert. So it kind of gives people to um, like teens, you know, because like when a lot of people go to concerts and see these rappers and artists is usually young adults, teenagers and stuff. So if they see um, them doing it and they promoting it, then they're going to think it's OK too to do it. So, yeah, I agree. Um, any last thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I just think that this is just so telling, you know, um, obviously, you know, if, if they're saying that they're not marketing to youth, then why aren't they doing, you know, why aren't they working with, you know, Gladys Knight? Why aren't they working with Earth, Wind & Fire? Like, why, <laughs> you know, like, then why are you working with people that, like, the youth are listening to? Like, that doesn't, don't, you know, don't lie to me. <laughs> yeah, I agree. And they do the little subtle stuff and they say, oh, we're not doing this or we're not doing that. But it's clearly <laughs> prominent that you're, you know, targeting to us and younger people also. Yeah, you know what you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, everyone. Does anyone know what tobacco type of tobacco product is a Swisher Sheets the brand? They also have flavored products. Anyone want to take a guess? It's actually uh, little cigars or cigarillos. So um, yeah, that's a, another product to have on your radar that is also flavored. So um, we're gonna actually go in breakout rooms to do those questions, but we just wanted to talk a little bit um, super quickly about our advocacy. Um, Diana, you wanna chat about this picture really quick? Um, sure. So back in 2019, the summer of 2019, before COVID, uh, we had went down to uh, Washington, um, D.C. and advocating against, you know, Jewel and everything. And it was a wonderful experience. We got to sit in the, you know, like the courtroom and everything. Um, and the man, I really don't remember his name, but had got exposed for a lot of the, you know, things that he was doing that wasn't really appropriate um, for him targeting kids and different things like that. And one of our biggest challenges was the fact that he had brought all these people to the courtroom so we couldn't sit in there and so they couldn't see our shirts and what we were advocating for. But eventually we were able to like get in there and hear the um, hearing and a lot of people had like posters and different signs up. So yeah, it was an, um, an amazing opportunity to be down there and to advocate for something that's you know powerful and that's affecting our youth. Thanks, Diana. Yeah, that was an awesome hearing that we attended where they exposed the CEO of Jewel and it came out that he was going into schools and even church groups and camps talking to youth children about Jewel. They were they knew exactly what they were doing, like Katie said. And then we just wanted to highlight one of our other um, efforts that we did recently. So this is uh, Deja. She is advocating and testifying at Philadelphia City Hall here. And um, vaping was so bad at her school that she actually talked about in her story that she needed to use the bathroom. She got her period and the bathrooms were locked because vaping was such a big issue. So she had to go to the nurse's office 
um, and just had a really powerful story about like, that's how bad vaping got at her school. Um, so we actually participated in this and the legislation passed. However, Big Tobacco wound up suing and we had that uh, law that we advocated really hard for is not um, in effect anymore. Um, so, you know, we need to keep up our efforts. This is long-term work. So I commend all of you for being here today and um, being involved in learning about advocacy because we, we need you for the fight. Uh, and we got a question from Zara. How can we attend such advocacy events and be able to meet and talk with legislators directly? So. I would say, you know, get involved locally. I'm sure a lot of you are already involved, you know, with American Heart Association, find, you know, local organizations. I'm gonna put, if you're in the Philly area, we'd love to work with you. That's our bit.ly if you wanna join um, us. And we have a barcode here, feel free to um, take a screenshot. And we also, I'm gonna put our Insta in the chat. So feel free to follow us on Insta because we do like calls for action and things like that. And my email is also there. Um, if you want to, oops, I only sent that to Diana. <laughs> so I'll send it to everyone. But you can also contact your legislators by yourself with your friends, with a group of people, this group, if you all are from, you know, similar areas, you can collaborate. Um, our legislators, they work for the community, they work for us, we can contact them anytime to talk about issues in our community that we wanna to talk to them about, whether it's tobacco or anything else. All right, so Katie, I know we went a little over time, but I think it was worth it to talk about some awesome advocacy. So we're happy to hang out for the breakout rooms too. And thanks all for your time. It absolutely was worth it. And thank you, thank you both so much. It was really great. Uh, really, really inspiring to hear all the great work that you've been doing. Um, and just, yeah, thank you. Um, so just real quick, sorry. Um, yeah, just to answer uh, Zara, you know, one of the ways that, you know, you can get involved with programs like this um, is through the great work of organizations um, like the area and Diana come from, but then also, you know, locally, we, Rebecca and I um, are your source for putting this together. So if you have issues that you want to talk about, if you have ways that you want to get involved, um, you know, definitely do so. We'll set up the meetings for you for legislators. We'll make sure you have the talking points. Heck, if, you know, if, if we can, we'll come with you in person and we'll make sure that, you know, you've got a good group and a good team. If you want to lead it, if you've got an organization that wants to lead it, you know, let's, let's do it. Let's get into it. Um, you know, we're absolutely happy to, to do that and set that up. Um, so any of you, all of you reach out. Um, if you are a youth that's working on programs, reach out to us. If you are an adult and you want us to talk to those youth, uh, that you're working with, you know, that's, that's what we're here for. So, um, so hope that helps. Um, so now we're about to go into our breakout rooms again to talk about this. Before we go, I would like to uh, reiterate that we would like everybody to go into the group that identifies with where you are. So if you are a middle high schooler, go to middle high school. If you are college, go to college. If you are beyond, go to beyond. This is very, very important because we want to make sure that people feel really comfortable where they are. And sometimes if somebody's younger, they might not feel comfortable talking with adults and vice versa. Um, and we want to make sure that people are really um, meeting uh, people that are within their age range so they can kind of talk about those issues um, together. So please make sure that you are going into the groups that best identify who you are, either A, middle high, either B, college, or C, uh, beyond. So uh, with that, we will be moving back into the breakouts to talk about flavored tobacco. Um, so we'll be doing that for a couple minutes now. Now that we are all coming back, any, uh, any thoughts uh, came out of the, um, the breakout session at all? I have one. So we were discussing um, flavors of vape to like attract people and Miss Katie, I think, yeah. Okay. No, no. Okay, hold on. I forgot. I think it was Ariel, Miss Ariel. Okay. She mentioned unicorn poop as a flavor, which is really funny because a lot of the group, the group of people who are interested in unicorns, who love unicorns, are children, like young children. So I find that really strange. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit older than a young person, and I don't. And uh, 
I got some pretty zany friends. I don't know anyone that would have unicorn poop, <laughs> e-cigarettes. So. That's what they do, right? And oh, that's cute. That's fun. Oh, that's for kids. Oh, you know, it's like it kind of reminds me of if you guys remember um, uh, in uh, Austin Powers, where she's like, "Oh, it's candy. I'm having fun." It's like that kind of thing, you know. Um, so yeah, sorry if that dated me. It was that was cool once. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, um, any uh, any any last thoughts on this one before we move ahead to our next uh, esteemed guests? Awesome. Um, well, Ariel, Diana, Diana and Ariel are heading out. So I want to thank them again so much for their um, help today and participation. And we'll make sure that everybody has their contact information. So if they have any questions or thoughts on anything, um, definitely we uh, are still going to be able to ask them that. Um, so next up. Uh, we have a very special presentation uh, from the Truth Initiative. Um, those of you may know them; they're one of the one of the big dogs when it comes to talking about tobacco and, and youth and tobacco. So we're really excited to have them. Uh, we have uh, Brian Coleman and uh, his team from Truth to talk about um, how to quit tobacco. You know, if 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 you've, you know, if, if no judgment, no fault. If you are somebody you care about. Um, has uh, you know fallen prey to these sinister means um, to get people hooked on tobacco? What do we do about that? How do how do we make that change? How do we um, you know move away from um, from tobacco use? So uh, Brian and the Truth Team, have it. Awesome. Thank you so much. So yeah, I'm just going to toss it right over to our youth trainers, actually. So Brianna and Crosby, who are going to hook you up with all the information you could possibly want and need. Um, so yeah, with that, I'll, I'll go ahead and pass it over. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Brianna. Me and Crosby are so happy to be here today with you guys. And um, I will let Crosby start off our presentation for us. I'm on mute. <laughs> hey guys, my name is Crosby. I'm so excited to be here. A little bit of facts about me. I started with Truth Initiative when I was in college and now I'm out of college and now I'm going to go to the law school. So I'm super excited. Um, any connections or wish me, wishing me luck would be great and much appreciated. And I'm just really excited to speak with you guys today. Another fact, I went to college also with Brianna. So hello everyone, as Crosby mentioned, me and her went to college together and I've been with Truth for two years now. I started off as an ambassador and now I am a trainer. So woo woo, two years. Um, I also went to Oakwood University. My major is pre-law and I have a minor in vocal performance and pedagogy. I know that's a mouthful, but we're super excited to be with you all here today. And so as I share my screen to get the presentation uploaded, we're just going to start. Yes, vocal performance. Woo. Uh, we're just going to get started and um, we want you guys to feel comfortable. Um, we are here for you guys. And so just give me one second. Okay, is everyone able to see my screen? Yes. yes. All right, so we're ready to rock and roll. Okay, so our first question is, who has heard of Truth Initiative? Like, have you ever seen our advertisements? Have you seen um, us on TV, in the news, on social media, Instagram? 
Twitter, Facebook, who has seen us, maybe just show, um, put your thumbs up. I see the celebratory sign emoji, um, just so we can see a little bit. Okay, so a few, a few. That's cool. So we are Truth Initiative, and I will let Crosby explain a little bit more about what we do and our community agreements for today. Okay, so we are here to share some facts, not persuade you guys. We're here to make certain decisions or live a certain way, or not to make certain decisions. We believe the truth speaks for itself. The facts, they should speak for itself. We keep it honest, real, and we focus on the experiences you all bring to the table. The truth campaign is not shaming people or using scare tactics. If there are people in here who vape, that's fine. We're just here to tell you the facts about vaping. This isn't a vaping intervention program. It's just a space for us to talk about a topic that adults rarely have with young people. And this is in a real genuine way. And before we get into our presentation, we have a warm up. Okay, so our warm up is called the waterfall. So I'm gonna explain really quickly and then we're gonna have you guys engage. So basically with this exercise, we want you guys, we're gonna ask you guys a question. So for example, I will ask who likes cheese? Now you're gonna type in your answer, I love cheese, I only like Parmesan, um, I like mac and cheese, you know, you're going to type your answers, but you're not going to send it in right away. We're going to give you guys some time, and then after the time allowed, we're going to say, okay, now let's send it in, and we're going to have a waterfall effect of all the comments so we can see how diverse everyone's answers is. So if you're ready, let me just see you put a thumbs up, and we will begin the exercise. Everyone ready? All right. Our first question is, what qualities do you look for in a friend? What qualities do you look for in a friend? And we're gonna give you guys some time. So just hold off from sending them in. Do you think they're ready, Crosby? I think they're ready. All right. Are y'all ready? So we're going to count down from three. And then when I get to one, I want to see everyone send in your comments. So ready? Three, two, one. Send it in. Oh, Ooh. wow. OK, so we're getting some good answers here, Crosby. We have two loyalties. I I'm see. Wow. Someone friendly and approachable kindness honesty those are good empathetic that's good trustworthy accepting supportive caring humor empathy honesty trustworthiness these are all great answers okay and so let's move on to our next question what's your opinion about social media is it good or is it bad Again, let's just wait until we type it in. So I'll give you guys some time. I feel like we shot like the Jeopardy song, you know, like the do do do. Okay, do you think they're ready, Crosby? I think they're ready. I think, I think they have uh, their fingers are ready. Okay, ready, guys, on the countdown. Three, two, one, send them in. Oh, send it. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I love these answers. Someone said it's good, but sometimes they can also be bad because of the different contents that people post. That's a good answer. Depends on the way it is used. It can be a bit of both. Good, both. 
I think it's sad. It makes people feel badly about themselves, especially young people. Wow, that's a good answer. So a lot of people are saying, a lot of people are in the middle, like it's good, it can be used for good, but it's also, they've seen a lot of bad. Um, Jalen said, it's good and bad, it has many pros and cons that can't be explained in this message. That's very true. And someone else said, it is somewhat in the middle, leaning a little more over to good, but still bad in some aspects. And Jessica said, it's positive. So, love the different opinions here. Okay. Our last and final question for you guys is, what do you think is the most pressing, pressing issue facing young people today? This is a loaded question, Crosby. This is a very loaded question. Answers could also be on social media what we just talked about like that could be a major issue today mm -hmm. what's going on in the world sure so many things are you ready ready three two one cinnamon pressure peers health and safety wow the planet's future peer pressure to fit in acceptance into society pressure to succeed mm -hmm. these are all great answers potential for more and secure an easy target for all types of things mm. Jalen mentioned um i believe there are lots of issues and it's hard to say what the most pressing issue is. However, for the sake of the discussion, I would say mental health. That's great. And someone else said the inability for those with differing opinions to get along and war, always war. Great answers, everyone. And so now we are moving into our next slide. And Crosby will explain this activity for us. Well, we're going to be reading these headlines. Our first activity is going to be light and quick. We're going to look at media portrays issues on mental health, so what we just talked about, and teen vaping to the public. In a moment, I will share a series of slides with titles from newspapers and other community publications concerning tobacco, vaping, and mental health. Once, we re once we've reviewed the titles, you will be moved into a breakout room later on into the activity um into the presentation for a brief discussion on two questions the two questions are what reactions feelings thoughts are you having after hearing these headlines what personal connections can you make to any of the headlines okay, okay. everyone can this is our first headline U.S. News study, e-cigarettes make it harder for kids to kick the habit. And our second one. And I want you guys to really like read and take in what they're saying. And I'll read this one. Ann Arbor News, isolation, pressure, and substance use, children and teens facing mental health, dysomony, Experts say this is a mental health issue. Lowry told the audience kids who also have increased access to substance use like vaping and marijuana. I'm not sure if it's related. And we'll move on to the next one.
And please remember to take a mental note of all the headlines that you're reading right now. And this one. And I don't know about you guys, but this one really speaks out to me. It says vaping and marijuana were used use more prevalent than those than the use of painkillers and cigarettes the survey found. That's a lot. In our last headline, and so to combat this and to spread awareness about mental health, Truth Initiative came up with this campaign, The Breath of Stress Air. And as we play this video for you, we really want you guys to look at the meaning behind this video and see what it speaks to you. Breathe in and wonder, is this helping? You're loud. Breathe, breathe out. Now you should feel much worse. Vaping nicotine can actually increase feelings of stress and anxiety. Let's call a vape what it is. It's a breath of stress air. See for yourself. Breathofstressair.com So, after watching that video, taking a breath of stress air at first busts the fantasy that vaping nicotine is a stress reliever and calls that tobacco industry out for promoting e-cigarettes and vaping as a way to deal with stress, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. In fact, vaping nicotine can increase stress levels and amplify feelings of anxiety and depression. That's a lot. So for years, vape companies targeted teens, like we said earlier in our breakout, how the flavors have been targeting teenagers with the unicorn poop flavor, um, and young adults with their harmful products. Products filled with addictive nicotine and toxic substances that can negatively impact both physical and mental health. 81% of e-cigarette users surveyed started vaping to help them cope with their stress, anxiety, and depression. But it turns out vaping nicotine can actually make things worse and worsen those symptoms. To put it simply, vaping nicotine can really mess with your head, which is why we're standing up and taking action to protect our generation's mental health. Okay, and so Truth Initiative has three main campaign issues. The first one is why tobacco prevention is a social justice issue, tobacco waste impactment on the environment, and the impact of nicotine addiction on youth mental health. So to get involved, it's really simple. We made it really easy. Everyone has a phone, iPhone, Android, everyone has a phone. So what you can do is text ACTION to 88709 and you will get many texts from this person named Kaz. He's a great person. And so um, just today I got one and it said, hey, um, and they sent a little snippet of information here's how you can get involved and you would click the link and it would show how you can get involved with truth and this is something that's easy you know you don't have to go on our website and every day and say oh you know what is truth doing we'll send it right to your phone and we'll make it easy to provide the information on you on these three campaign issues well before we close we're going to take a stress-free breath together so the opposite of what we just watched. Just ground yourself in your seat and follow along with the video.
Okay, and so we have some additional resources for you guys. If you guys um, would like some help with mental health and vaping info at thetruth.com. And so you can copy this and put it right into your web browser and it can give you more information. If you know someone or if you yourself would like help quitting vaping, you can touch Ditch, Ditch Vape to 88709. And we've helped over 400,000 people using this is quitting program and our truth breath work exercise that you guys just did is another additional resource and of course there's a 24 7 crisis text line you can text home to 741741 all right so we're gonna do breakout questions about the headlines that we read earlier And these are the two questions that you guys will be answering in your breakout rooms. What reactions, feelings, or thoughts do you have after reading the headlines? And what, and what personal connections, connections can you make to any of these headlines? Can you Awesome. Thank you guys so much for these breakout guidance questions. We will be moving into the breakout now. Again, just a reminder, go into the breakout that best aligns with where you are in your life. Are you middle high school? Are you college? Are you beyond? Um, so please go there and, uh, and we'll talk about all this stuff. So. As everyone comes back in, Crosby, did you get some good answers? You're on mute. What is it? <laughs> I think it's gonna go from unmute to mute like automatically. <laughs> Sorry, I was just saying about how um, a lot of people were shocked. Well, not a lot of people, but um, my wonderful group, um, we had one woman talk about how, you know, she doesn't even have kids, but she's angered by this. Mm. And by kids. Um, we had another woman talk about how much it was emphasized on mental health and um, in, the, in the articles and how people, this is my interpretation of like what we were talking about. People are you know, becoming more aware about the mental health, but what are we, what are we doing? So that's why we have action, like the, the steps that we're trying to take in our breath of uh, our videos too, to like counteract what, what um, the vaping uh, companies are doing. Mm, that's good. Those are good answers. All right, I think we're doing a quick recap here. Brianna and Crosby, it sounded like you started some of that conversation already, uh, just things that were coming up in, in your groups. Um, my group is a little shy or tired. We're not sure yet, but we're gonna let it hang there uh, and, and hear what other folks maybe had to share. Um, so anything you wanna lift up or just report back to the group? Um. Yeah, as Crosby was saying in my group, like we were talking about ways um, you know, to help people. And I mentioned, I talked about truths, this is quitting. We talked about support groups. We talked about, you know, not judging people, but just providing them with the facts. And then whenever they're ready, you know, we have these options and we know the options that are able to help them as well. And so it was really refreshing to hear Crosby uh, mention about like how she mentioned someone um, read the headlines and, you know, she didn't have kids. She was so angered by it, you know, and it's like reading this and being knowledgeable about this is very moving.
Thank you, Brianna. Crosby, any closing thoughts for you? Yeah, we talked about other additional facts um, and because we were, again, stuck on the whole target and how they're literally targeting young people. And I mentioned how they're also targeting them financially with scholarships and how they're letting students write articles or, I mean, essays about um, you know, how is vaping good for you? So things like that. And they're giving money away for that. That's another way of targeting them, um, not only just emotionally and like telling them that this will help stress, give them stress-free life, but financially too, which is, I think, goes hand in hand, being financial, giving money. That's a weight off my shoulder. <laughs> so definitely, yeah, I mentioned some of that, um, about how there's different ways that they're targeting young people. Awesome, thank you so much. So I know we are over on our time, but thank you all. Um, this is the very, very start of a big, big conversation, right? So I just wanna put that on the table. There was a lot to digest here, a lot to talk about and get through, um, but we wanted to acknowledge that things are rough, right? Folks are in a really um, challenging situation across the board, right? And so for some people, this might be something that's showing up every day for you. It's very present in your life. Um, and for other folks, it might not be as present, but it's an issue that we're all connected to. It's an issue that we all should be involved in uh, addressing and supporting. Um, and this is just how Truth is doing a little bit of that work, right? So um, we have a ton of resources. We'll make sure that the team, you all, Rebecca, Katie, that you have that um, access to that stuff to share out with everyone. But uh, we hope to have this conversation again, a little more time with you to really dig into what's happening. But um, thank you. Thank you, Crosby. Thank you, Brianna. And thank you for everyone else. Thank you. Thank you guys for having us. We really appreciate you all. Well, thank you guys. We really appreciate you coming on and sharing the information. It was uh, very informative. Really, it's awesome. I, I, I work in this space and I've seen, you know, truth ads or articles or things about stuff that um, I didn't know about or that I didn't really think about in that way. So it's been a real, real treat to hear from you guys and, and the way that you guys are working and um, working on these projects too. So. Thank you all uh, so much again. Um, Thank you. Yeah. So before we move on to um, our next piece, actually, um, Crosby, I love that you mentioned targeting because that is what we're going to talk about next. Uh, let me pull it up if it's possible. Um, I'll tell you what, you know, what? let me make sure that this is ready. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go uh, right now into our uh, next break, our next 10 minute break. And then when we come back, um, ooh, anticipation, um, we will see a really great, important and powerful video about targeting and, um, and, and why that's a big issue um, for us. So 10 minute break, uh, come back at 5.52 and uh, talk about targeting and go from there thank you all so much remember don't leave just put it on mute and then uh and then come back to it i would like to introduce our next speaker her name is ashlyn roman and uh she it, I first came to know Ashland actually um, when she was attending or had just graduated from the University of Vermont. And she actually had presented to not only um, youth, but she had also presented to lawmakers um, as well um, for um, her, her uh, study of uh, health marketing, um, and she also revealed when she was uh, talking about her knowledge, she also had been a user herself. And so she was using not only her uh, use knowledge, but also like what she had uh, come to um, learn through her, her studies. So Ashland, you have the floor. Thank you, Rebecca. I'm gonna try to share my screen. Is there any way I can take control of it for a second? I'll share screen, there we go. Um, let's 
not giving me that option for some reason. Desktop one. Is the greet the share screen button lit up for you? It is, but for some reason my PowerPoint is not opening. Oh, now it's loading. <laughs> Always happens that way. Mm. Yeah, no, I don't think it's gonna let me share my PowerPoint today. That's okay. There's not much on it. It was just a table or two. But I can just describe that myself. <laughs> okay. Let me close this up then. Okay, sorry about that. Not very technologically versed, but yes. Hi, my name is Ashlyn. I'm an alumni of the University of Vermont. Um, I've been a tobacco researcher for three or four semesters now with intents to pursue this topic when I start my master's at the University of Texas Health Sciences in August. And like Rebecca said, I am a former user. I've used everything. I've used electronic cigarettes, mostly combustible cigarettes. I've used the pouches like smokeless tobacco, um, I've transitioned to NRTs, nicotine replacement therapies, and throughout the duration of my final two semesters of college when I was writing my main thesis, which I'll kind of break down a little bit today, um, a little short description, I actually quit smoking then. So I have an emotional attachment to this topic, personal experience, and a decent amount of academic work related to it. That's just the background. So I guess just kind of jumping in, I'll give a little perspective on what I studied. Um, I studied college student smoking behaviors, both tobacco and cannabis, and I'll kind of get into how those are intertwined moving forward. But I focused on college students due to my relationship with the topic, my experience, but also because college students are part of the age group or young adults with the highest percentage of smokers, although they are often non-daily users with irregular patterns of use. Um, and that age group being 18 to 24, and this is important to know because if smoking behaviors are ceased or regulated prior to the age of 30, the risk for smoking induced chronic illness drastically decreases and as much as a decade may be added on to life expectancy, which does give colleges the unique opportunity to target one of, one of the higher risk groups of smokers that are more willing to experiment with different substances and mitigate unhealthy behaviors before they result in long-term health, effect, health effects. And this research was done to hopefully contribute to developing higher efficacy social marketing campaigns and public health programs um, with the goals to understand motivations behind smoking behaviors, including sociocultural and psychological motivations, how students perceive their use and their willingness to access resources and how they perceive health marketing and social marketing on campuses and in their communities. Um, some of the questions I'll talk about with you today are how social context influences things, how stress and psychological context influences both what they smoke, how they smoke, frequency of use, um, how students' perceptions about health risk influence their behavior, and what students and young adults 18 to 24 are looking for to help them eventually cease use of nicotine products. Um, quickly, this was done with 10 ethnographic interviews and 40 responses to an open response survey. Um, jumping in, I think the biggest thing that I talked about um, in terms of nomenclature and language that students were using to define their smoking behaviors was how they actually defined a smoker. Um, and there was little agreement among the people I spoke to about what actually constitutes a smoker. There was a trend of interviewees determining that only those that consume nicotine are gonna be, like through combustible cigarettes are going to be a smoker. And there was always a sense of hesitancy to describe oneself to be a smoker with several participants citing their apprehension as a result of the stigma surrounding the term smoker and being addicted to nicotine. Um, this led many people to manipulate their definitions of a smoker to not encompass their personal behaviors, whether that be the substance that they use or their frequency of use. And notably, this is gonna be the disconnect between social smoking and regular smoking, with social smoking only being done in large group settings, really subject to peer pressure. There's gonna be a little bit of variation in how people are consuming nicotine, where a regular smoker is gonna consistently have their own device. Um, and this is important to understand um, to make sure health marketing materials are inclusive and utilize language that is understood by their target audience. So people know that the programs and resources available to them are applicable to their patterns of smoking. Um, 
I did have a table to show you, but since it won't work, I'll just say that it was a response to the survey question of how like how much more likely are you to smoke and smoke more when you're in a group setting and about 63% of participants said they were significantly more likely to smoke in a social setting. Um, practices of social smoking were highly influenced by social context for tobacco use very specifically. Um, if others were using combustible tobacco or electronic cigarettes, it increased the likelihood of using them and nearly all participants, even the ones that I spoke to that only smoked cannabis regularly and did not own their own personal tobacco products. This is particularly the instance where there was alcohol use with conjunctive use of alcohol and cannabis or alcohol and tobacco products. Um, even those that, that didn't, like I said, smoke tobacco products would use them while drinking. Um, and students often cited smoking as a way to form social bonds. Um, nicotine consumption method was subject to little variation in terms of group unless it was drinking in which people were always going to be more likely to use a combustible cigarette, even if they normally just use electronic cigarettes. Um, it's in this ritualized process that I'm sure most people here have heard of called the drunk cig. And it's pretty popular on college campuses for students to say that or even just in young adult circles that drunk cigs don't count. I'm sure that's been around for a while, that phrase at least. Um, participants would just call it a social process as it often entails separating from larger groups into smaller ones to go smoke. Um, moving on to psychological stress, the imaginary table I had asked people how much more they are likely to smoke and smoke more if they have are experiencing day-to-day -day stressors and 67% of people said they were significantly more likely to use, which you have heard about today a little bit already. Um, but yes, contexts that have negative effect on emotional state did increase the likelihood of interviewees in partaking in smoking behaviors, particularly nicotine products as an immediate response to stress. Um, even participants that actually used both cannabis and nicotine products said that they turned to nicotine when experiencing stress and participants that use nicotine very rarely, only socially, but use cannabis daily, still cited nicotine as their go-to resource if they were experiencing stress um, as a negative urgency reaction. Cannabis users did not experience the same negative urgency and need to stress relief smoking, with the only exception being the use of, and I'm gonna say the term moles because that's popular where I was doing research, but to give context, moles are a combination of combustible tobacco and combustible um, cannabis, which has so many different terms I learned from my thesis, depending on where you are in the country, even within the Eastern states. Um, moles were going to be used by participants that regularly use them when they're stressed at a much higher frequency in the same way that someone who just was smoking combustible tobacco or vaping would do. Um, one student said that during finals week, they actually would do through the bong, like a bong bowl of moles, they would do about 12 a day, um, which is a, an incredibly high amount of nicotine and cannabis. And this was a profound concern I found in my data with 75% of regular cannabis users saying they could conjunctively use the two substances. And there are a bunch of different modes. It's gonna be through a bowl, pipe, bong, blunt, or joint. And the ratio is not regulated. It can be any amount of cannabis or tobacco varying between individuals and between smoking sessions. And cannabis users that begin combining cannabis and tobacco are more likely to become regular tobacco users and dependent on nicotine. Um, there's a couple of testimonies of people that were taking tolerance breaks or tea breaks from cannabis that had been using moles instead of just solely cannabis. And they said they went through such extreme withdrawal symptoms like the shakes and the cold sweats at night, more so than I had heard of even just tobacco users withdrawing um, that they could not withdraw successfully. Um, but many people had tried to quit using both and could not. And conjunctive use may also lead to greater health complications. So it's such a profound concern in this field. Um, I guess moving forward to more students' perceptions of their use and turning to the future in this field and what students are looking for and young adults are looking for to help them cease use. Almost all of the students I spoke to did want to positively change their health behavior by decreasing risk or completely ceasing use of these products. But there was a hesitancy among young adults in reaching out to resources or addiction specialists for assistance. And this was for a number of different reasons, I'd say prominently because of not having a consistent definition of a smoker and feeling that programming that was marketed towards combustible tobacco users or just cigarette smokers would not be efficient or applicable to those that started vaping like many people in my age group did in high school when they were adolescents starting on flavored tobacco products or box mods or jewels. 
or that if they used cannabis and tobacco, that they wouldn't be able to re receive assistance from these programs, or if they didn't own their own product and they weren't addicted. Um, and then there also being the over underlying fear of social repercussions, uh, especially on a college campus, being both social with your peers and your professors or academic or financial for breaking the rules for using substances. Um, and I think the most alarming thing that I found in this research was something that I had done myself, my friends have done, uh, my loved ones have done as well, and that is attempt to reduce harm without the assistance of a program or addiction specialist, but in a manner that increases harm significantly. And that is going to be the transition from vaping to using combustible cigarettes. Um, obviously, electronic cigarettes were marketed supposedly um, as a better alternative to combustible cigarettes. But as college students often start on electronic cigarettes nowadays, they can transition from combustible cigarettes to regulate their use and decrease their nicotine dependence, which is obviously not an effective or better solution by any means. Um, but participants often describe this transition as a way to decrease their frequency of use or habitual use, citing that overconsumption of nicotine via vape was related to an oral fixation. So the decreased accessibility of spaces to smoke combustible cigarettes allowed smokers to better control and regulate their use. And it just offered a better way to, and I say better way in quotes because it's not true, um, gauge and assess consumption, whereas it's much harder with electronic cigarettes. Um, and continuing on in this hesitancy to access programs to prevent situations like this from happening that I experienced and my best friends experienced and people on my campus experienced is um, finding stigma in marketing and in programming. And once again, being afraid of the pushback. And at least on the campus I was doing research on, there was an overwhelmingly negative response to some language used in some health marketing, um, suggesting that students were actually more likely to use their devices in response to the stress of reading that marketing due to some authoritative language used in the science, which came off to students as aggressive and degrading. And one interview, we went as far to say that they felt as if the signs and the marketing on campus spoke to them as if they were children. And several said they propagated this very shame and stigma associated with smoking that often manifests in smoking behaviors as an increase in use due to response to less psychological stress. Um, and this becomes the issue with making sure that marketing is developmentally appropriate for different age groups. Um, with college students, we're at the precipice of finally gaining our independence and living independently. And anything that feels degrading or very authoritative is just going to be received with a sort of pushback. Um, but looking to the future, I guess the biggest transition would be to eliminate um, authoritative language and the practice of stigma and marketing. Um, I mean, public health has a long history of employing stigma and denormalization strategies, which very can be effective. Um, there's been a large decrease in cultural acceptance of combustible cigarette use in the West, but it's abundantly clear that it is a temporary solution. And stigma is a barrier to healthcare access as individuals may be apprehensive to seek care for fear of judgment. And unfortunately, technological advancement and the very predatory tobacco industry will consistently develop new products to get around contemporary stigma. Um, thinking of Zen pouches, and if anyone isn't familiar, those are like a little cloth pouch that you pack similar to chewing tobacco filled with granules that dispense nicotine over time. I've met people that have started on those instead of vaping or smoking because they didn't want to be caught by their peer smoking or vaping, but they were introduced to Zen pouches and there's a couple other brands as well. So shame is a temporary if ineffective solution and can do more harm than good. Many young adults actually would like peer support systems on campuses or in communities to contribute to destigmatizing addiction among students. Um, they want environments in which they can discuss their use and goals with like-minded individuals that are their own age. I know these existed in the city that I was doing research in, but they were a broad age range and different smoking patterns with people that had started many, many decades ago or years ago on combustible cigarettes, whereas a lot of the group I spoke to started on electronic cigarettes. Um, I think that implementing these groups is incredibly effective as students cite a roadblock to positive change, not being surrounded by people that are equally willing and committed to ceasing their use of nicotine products. My first semester of researching this topic, I spoke to a participant who could not quit because they were living with a partner that was vaping. And two years later, my final semester of college, I spoke with them again and their roommates were vaping and they still could not quit and said they would not even attempt to quit again after their fifth time of failing to quit until they moved out of that environment. 
Um, and then just reevaluating public health programming as well, um, circling back to the conjunctive use of cannabis and tobacco products. Um, we cannot treat tobacco and cannabis use as separate entities necessarily if they are consistently being combined by young adults. Um, and that also includes electronic cigarettes as well with some people using practicing poly tobacco use with electronic cigarettes and combustible cigarettes, varying use depending on social context or stress levels. Um, Co-consumption is a great issue and to address the relationship with those substances relationship is not necessarily the best word, but use of those substances together, if they're being used together by a participant, will be much more effective than just trying to address one or the other at a time. Um, in terms of access as well, ensuring increase of access programs to young adults that are suited for young adults and ensuring nicotine replacement therapy access at your local retailers. I cannot stress this enough. There's been so many retailers I've been to when I was living in Burlington, Vermont, that would not sell NRTs to young adults that were not 21 due to confusion surrounding the tobacco 21 policy. Whereas at 18, you should be able to buy, I think it's gum, patches and lozenges to help you cease your use of um, inhaling or smoking nicotine products. Um, and then pushing for comprehensive in case education for adolescents and young adults alike. Students at all universities are required to complete a compulsory alcohol use training prior to the start of their first semester. And usually about 25% of this training focuses on other substances, um, but this just simply is not an adequate level of education for smoking material since it's so prevalent among college students. And smoking initiation often begins in conjunction with alcohol consumption as well. So they should be addressed with equal footing, I would say. And then my final piece would just be what the AHA always does and push for legislative change and advocacy work, get an overall ban on flavored tobacco products, as you saw from the video, very powerful video we just saw before. Their menthol cigarettes and flavored tobacco are so predatorily advertised towards adolescents and groups from structurally disadvantaged populations. And we need to criminalize that predatory marketing practices of the tobacco industry. And I wish I could show you all the picture that I found this afternoon when preparing for this. Um, but since I can't, I will describe it and you can go find it yourself. But there is a disposable nicotine device called a loon that I have only found in the state of Vermont so far, which is 6.5% nicotine per device and ranges from 400 to 2000 inhales. That is the highest disposable commercial device I have seen in my time researching this so far. Um, incredibly addicting, prevented me from recovering from being addicted to nicotine on multiple occasions when I was introduced to those. Many of the people I researched with, my friends, my loved ones were introduced to these products and could not quit because it is just such a high nicotine content, but very strong fruity flavor. But the picture that was posted on June 1st actually was their new product out and it was a pink vape that said on Wednesdays we smoke pink in reference to mean girls just channeling back to that predatory advertising practice so often done by the tobacco industry trying to cater towards young adults and adolescents with that one but otherwise the information that I have just given to you is not open source yet but if anyone I can put my email in the chat and if anyone would like to read more I am so very willing to send them my research and my papers, whatever they would like to see. But otherwise that is all from me, Rebecca. Unless anyone has any questions. Thank you, Ashlyn. Um, let me click on the chat here. Actually, I had one question, just kind of like a follow up. Um, when you were talking about, um, as far as um, you were saying that you can be 18 and purchase you, um, quitting patches and gums, correct? But the retailers are having an uh, issue because they're not sure um, because of uh, the 21 for purchasing, correct? So they're they're concerned about what what is called um, like pup laws, which is the per, purchase um, or underage purchasing for for young adults, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Was that like? Um, did you talk to many retailers about that? Like they were all really kind of. 
confused about like being able to like sell to somebody. So if, if somebody wanted to quit, like they would just, it, they would almost need it like an adult to come with them to be able to purchase the, the um, patches and the, and the gums, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't a ton. It wasn't, it was enough of an issue that in my research, when I presented my dissertation, um, I don't know if anyone's heard of Andrea Volante. She works at UVM, now works at Rutgers, has been doing research in the field for so long. I said that you had to be 21 and that was an access issue. And at the end of my presentation, she was like, nope, you have to be 18. And I read this and I checked with the Department of Health and they've run into this issue a few times before. Um, I've run into it myself probably three or four times at different retailers before I turned 21 and about four people in my study had gone to different ones than I had and had an issue. Um, it would just be going up and they would scan your ID and they were like, you're not 21, you can't buy this. Or they just scan it. You're not 21, you can't buy this. And I actually tried to talk to a manager at one major store in Burlington, Vermont. And the manager just yelled at me and told me, I didn't know what I was talking about. And I was like, please just read the laws on the FDA's website <laughs> and you will see that it is 18 rather than being the only major store in this city right here next to the college that will not sell to 18 year olds that want to quit. That one is definitely interesting. I hadn't, I didn't even know about that. Um, does anybody else like have any uh, questions? Yeah, actually I do. Um, they're really interested in a lot of stuff you're talking about. Um, I was interested in the work that you were talking about uh, with cannabis use um, and particularly um, blunt ramps. Do you see that people uh, believe that they are using tobacco um, with that, not realizing that the, um, the wraps themselves are tobacco? I haven't seen that people don't realize it. I think that's like a whole trend or phenomenon calling it a like a backwoods rap I think you're talking about like smoking a backwoods um that was a little less popular I would say at UVM it was more actually combining the two in a bong or a bowl but I didn't run into the issue of people thinking that it was that it was uh, not knowing that it was tobacco I think they usually did and did it intentionally I guess my other question, um, so when you were doing like your study, you, you mentioned that um, quite a few people didn't want to identify themselves as a smoker, but um, what, I guess I'm curious, uh, did you find out if what the FDA like labeled as a smoker, like what the definition versus like people's perception? I definitely did and it's written down somewhere, but I can't remember off the top of my head because <laughs> it's been like a year and a half. Um, there's been a couple studies because I think there's a little bit of just generalized confusion as to whether or not vaping counts in that term. Um, but when I came down to it with like public perception, I would I would ask people if you would call someone that vapes a vapor and everyone was like, no, that sounds really silly. Like I would just call them a smoker. I wouldn't call them anything was another one. It's like, oh, they, they just vape, but they're not anything technically. They're not a smoker though. Uh, but there are people who even used combustible cigarettes regularly that said they weren't a smoker for other reasons. It was just kind of like, that's not me though. You know, like if it was just a little bit more extreme, that would be me. That one's really interesting to me. Um, does anybody else have like any questions? All right. Well, thank you, Ashlyn. We really appreciate it. It was very informative. Um, I think our, we're going to go into our breakout rooms here to kind of discuss. So um, if anybody has any questions that they're shy to ask for the big group, maybe we can discuss it in the small group. So um, again, just kind of select your age group that you think you feel most comfortable in and we're discussing and we'll, uh, Go from there. All right, welcome back, everybody. Uh, did everybody have uh, anything that they wanted to share that they thought was interesting in their chat group?
All right. Well, I know that we're we're getting close to like the the end here of our schedule event. Um, so uh, we wanted to. Uh, hopefully everybody got a chance to do the sign-in form. Um, for those who couldn't sign in, um, we'll email it out to you. Um, but the sign-in form, we were asking you guys for your information because we really appreciate your time. And we know that it's over dinner time and that we're not in person. We wanted to find a way to like um, give you a chance to have uh, lunch slash dinner or breakfast on us if you're a breakfast person. Um, so we will be sending out an Uber Eats gift card to everybody who uh, participated today. Um, so please make sure that your information is in the sign in form and we will send it to you electronically. Right, so as we wrap up, um, before we start getting into our plans for tomorrow and some great information we have for you, does anybody have any uh, last thoughts on things that they've learned today, things that they've thought about? Um, what is something that you, that you learned today that you didn't know before? I'll start calling on people, I will. <laughs> I will say that I, I learned um, I learned quite a bit um, from Ryan's presentation. That one was really interesting about the propaganda and then how cigarettes are portrayed as this stress reliever, but in reality, it's just this constant loop-to-loop -loop that you're on of trying to maintain the nicotine in your body. Yeah, I thought that yeah, was really interesting. I also learned that from Ryan about how um, smoking is portrayed as a good mental health thing, but it's actually the opposite and it can worsen those effects. But also I learned about how um, vapor products and tobacco products are portrayed in media as colorful, fun, cool to target certain audiences. Yeah, very interesting. Anyone else? Janelle said that she's learned about some of the other devices like Puff Bar and the effects they can have um, and flavored products that attack, that attract children and teens. I would go ahead and add, um, can everybody hear me? It's yeah. Tamika again, can everybody hear me? Um, I wanna add about the, you know, going into the store in regards to the marketing the eye level. I thought even though I go into the stores and you see it, but you don't realize it. And I think by talking about it today, it just made me more aware um, of that educational component in regards to their targeting our children. Why is it not? I think one of the young presenters has said, why is it not eye level for adults? It's, you know, the level for our, you know, for our children. So that was definitely an eye opener, something to walk away with. Thank you, Tamika. Anyone else? Anything that gave you food for thought? Things that you're going to take away from today? Yeah, Alana says learned how they targeted specific minorities and age groups uh, in use of vaping and cigarettes. Very much so. There's actually a quote. Um, I'm going to paraphrase, I don't have it specifically, um, but R.J. Reynolds, um, executive, the people, you know, one of the major tobacco manufacturers um, in the 70s uh, said that they don't use tobacco products. Um, tobacco is for the young, black, and stupid. So, um, and that was 50 years ago, they said that. Um, so they've known what they were doing and they've known for a long time. All right. Well, I, oh, Jalen said, uh, 
I would say that I've learned a lot from this meeting as a whole, even though some of it was familiar to me. But one thing that has made me surprised with the percentage of people who are more stressed from the usage of these drugs. Not only that, but the large percentage of people who feel less stressed after not using the drugs. I agree with that one. Yeah. I appreciate that you said drugs too. You know, a lot of people think of this as something different than that, um, but that's what that is. Yeah. Well, um, shoot. Yeah. So for tomorrow, um, before we, our final like wrap up here, um, tomorrow we actually, uh, we will be giving, have some giveaways tomorrow. Um, it's a little bit more of a fun day, a little bit more of a um, practice of what we have learned so far. So we're going to talk a little bit of putting your advocacy voice uh, to work. Um, and then we're going to hear from the New Jersey Incorruptible Us. Uh, they will be on to present and the youth there will actually be talking about how they put their voice to use in their communities and statewide. So that's going to be really exciting. And then we're going to get into your competitive side where we're going to have some trivia questions. It may be about tobacco. It may be about the AHA. Um, and it may just have some random trivia in there. So if you are a trivia buff, bring it. Um, and, uh, and we're going to have some prizes and drawings um, for tomorrow as well. Yes, so make sure you go to both days because we got stuff for you today, but we got fun stuff for you tomorrow too. So make yeah. sure that you come tomorrow, learn some more, take the stuff that you're learning here. We're gonna figure out how to put that into, into real action. So the fun, the fun continues. And uh, in addition to that, no problem if you're gonna be late to the meeting tomorrow, Milagros. I hope, did I pronounce that right? Give me a thumbs up if I did. I wanna make sure that I'm... Yeah, you did. Uh, okay. I go by Millie yeah. if it makes it easier. Oh, okay. Great. Great. Thank you, Millie. Um, yeah, so um, it's okay if you're going to be late or whatever. That's fine. Uh, we just hope that you'll show up and we'll make sure that we're getting all that fun stuff out to you. Um, and if you are available um, ahead of time, pull this up. Uh, we have a really great presentation, uh, a great event coming up tomorrow. Um, this is a national Hearts with Pride celebration. So if you are a member of the LGBTQIA uh, group or you're an ally of that group, we really encourage you to come out um, to celebrate, honor, and commemorate Pride Month um, with the whole rest of the American Heart Association. So that will be really fun. We'll have some really great uh, games and performances and guests um, that we really hope get you excited to talk about um, heart health. Um, as we're talking about um, targeted and uh, marginalized communities, the LGBTQIA community is definitely a part of that. Um, there is, um, as we're talking about that, I could also show you almost as much stuff um, as we have for communities of color as we do with the LGBT community and how they've been marketed. Uh, plus there's a higher incidence of um, depression and anxiety because of the stigma and because of the uh, discrimination that happens due to uh, being LGBTQIA. So um, it's really an important group. So we really hope you can come out to that. Lots of fun. Um, I'm gonna put the uh, sign up info in the chat box. Maybe I will, I'll do it. Um, so yeah, we really hope you can come out to that. It's, it's right before we start um, the program tomorrow. So we hope you'll come out for that. Oh, and a reminder, it starts at four tomorrow. Yes, four to six. So it's a little shorter tomorrow, uh, but twice the fun. Yeah. Does anybody else have any, uh, anything they'd like to add? Or, so, close it. All right. If anybody's interested, I just added the Zoom meeting um, for tomorrow for the Hearts with Pride meeting. Um, if you'd like to come to that, we'd love to have you. All right. Well, I really want to thank everybody for coming out for this. Um, and 
for um, really being a part of this. Um, and should we do is there? I guess I will do one quick trivia question. Um, let's see here. I to confirm, Rebecca, that link is the same, correct, for tomorrow? Yes, the same, the same exact link. So it's the same link for tomorrow. So one quick trivia question to get you guys primed for tomorrow, and the quickest person will get to break into the chat box. Or if you want to come off mute, we got a hoodie. I don't know. It's not showing up. There it goes. Maybe. Fair enough. This is what happens when you have a background. So, uh, what percentage of teens? Um, I know this question off the top of my head. What percentage of teens uh, say that they start using tobacco products because of flavors? Closest wins it. What? Closest wins it. Closest wins it. So in the chat, what percentage of teens? Is it 10%? Is it 45%? Is it 100%? Anyone else? Any other Going guesses? Once. Going twice. Going three times and ta -da. You want to call it the winner, Katie? All right. Well, I think we got some ringers. There's dope. There's there's super winners. Yeah. All right. The answer is 80%. So congratulations to Jalen and Janelle. Um, as long as you have filled out your uh, sign up form, we'll have your size and your address to send it out. If you have not, um, make sure you do it so we have your size and we have your address and that will be part of your prize pack. Congratulations. Everybody was really close on that number, actually. I'm really impressed. You guys did a really good job on thinking about that and working that out. Millie, you were close. You were close. Uh, yeah. <laughs> great job, though. Awesome. It's okay. We'll have tons of fun tomorrow, and you'll have even more opportunities. Yes. So we have t-shirts, hoodies. We even have ring lights, mobile ring crazy. lights. We're going to get some stuff from, from Truth. You yeah. guys are going to get hooked up. If you come tomorrow, psh, we're going to give you all the prize bag. Mm -hmm. It's going to be an ultimate one. So it's that's just ultimate. the start of ours. You can blow your mind. So. All right. Awesome. Thanks so much, everybody. Um, just want to remind you, just think about tonight. Just think about some of that stuff um, that we had talked about today. Think about um, elevator speech, what that looks like to you, what that thinks, uh, what that what that may look. I know we haven't really talked about it. So what, do, what, do you, what does elevator speech mean to you? Um, Look it up, find out tomorrow, uh, but just kind of keep that in mind um, and how how exactly uh, you best communicate your story, your ideas and your thoughts um, when you are talking with uh, other advocates and other leg and other leg legislators. So. All right. Any last thoughts or ideas before we go for today? Awesome. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out. I really appreciate it. Uh, we'll send you the information from today, and uh, we'll see you all tomorrow for more fun and games. Yes.